Hey Gary, how are you doing? Hey, I'm good. So welcome to Screen Time and thank you very much for collaborating with Virtual Design Festival today. Um, we, you have very kindly allowed our readers to see RAMS, your, your full length documentary about Dieter RAMS, which is streaming on your site in a special Virtual Design Festival page. And if our readers want to see that, they can click on the post about you in uh, Virtual Design Festival and click straight through to that. Thanks very much for that. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Gary. See if you could explain who you are and where you are and what you do. <laughs> uh, well, I'm a uh, filmmaker primarily. Um, I'm based here in New York City in Brooklyn um, in my kitchen. Um, I've been making films for 15 years now. Um, started producing them a few years before that. But um, I didn't have a classically trained film background. I didn't go to film school. I was uh, really involved in independent music and um, working with bands and indie labels. And through, um, you know, a, a couple decades of that and independent book publishing, somehow I got involved in film. And there were just a lot of movies that I wanted to watch um, that didn't exist. And I've always kind of done things on a very sort of DIY independent um, basis where if there's something that you want, um, uh, you can just, you know, figure out how to do it and go out and, and, and make it yourself. So um, I've always been kind of interested in graphic design and, and, and fonts. And I mean, I'm not a professional graphic designer, but I'm just something that I was into. And, um, and I really wanted to watch a movie about fonts and there wasn't anything. So I, I couldn't understand why. And I just picked up a camera in 2005 and started making what became Helvetica. And I guess that was your big introduction to the design world. That's what that's certainly how I heard about you. But before you started making films about design, what, what kind of films were you producing? <clears throat> um, so in 2000, um, right when I moved, just after I'd moved to New York, I got a DVD player. And that was like a big DVD was, a, you know, a big new thing. And, um, and I got really into DVDs and just looking for interesting indie films and music projects, but like couldn't really find anything. So I started a, a DVD label um, called Plexifilm uh, and just started, I don't know, trying to release cool cult films or independent music uh, films or just whatever we felt like it was very much like an independent record label, but for, for film. Um, and very quickly filmmakers began, became, um, began approaching us and just saying, Hey, I've got this film. I'm trying to finish it. Can you help? We want to, you know, we want to release it. So I got involved in producing, um, several music documentaries. The first was about the band Wilco, um, it was called, I'm trying to break your heart. So, um, <clears throat> through that, um, process, I got to see kind of how a documentary was made and, and released. And um, so I did a few other music related docs or helped produce them um, before, uh, you know, in 2005, starting starting Helvetica. So it was really music. Music has been a big um, influence for me early on. And even even now, you know, I like I, I a lot of times when I when I have an idea for for a film, I can kind of um, I kind of hear what it sounds like as much as I like think about what it's going to look like visually, and and I, and I often think that um, since really my only training in this was like you know watching music documentaries get made and being a fan of music documentaries, my films are kind of like <clears throat> excuse me like they're like music documentaries about design, um, and and music is still a very important part of the of these design films too. So you mentioned that you started, you said something like, I got myself a camera and I started to make a film that became Helvetica. Is that, was it as simple as that? You just thought, hmm, I'm interested in fonts. Hmm, let me go and film some fonts. Did you really not have a plan to make a, a movie out of it? Or are you just being a bit modest? <clears throat> um, it's really as simple as that. Uh, at first, it wasn't going to be of just about one typeface. Like at first, I, I was thinking more of this, um, more of a survey film that like, you know, I'd go and talk to different designers about type and how they use type and maybe we'd see cities and type, you know, out in the environment. Um, and it was going to be a much more kind of ephemeral feeling, you know, uh, 
But then um, it was just around the time when Helvetica was, you know, had had this resurgence and kind of this backlash against it. And in design magazines like Emigre and others, people were debating if it was good or bad. And you had Designers for Public and all these, you know, experimental jet set. Um, and then all people like Massimo Vignelli and, you know, everybody kind of, you know, going at it. And uh, so we, I just felt like it would be an interesting structure, like a way to look at all these things, but to kind of condense it into one one typeface. And then I, I was living in New York City and it's everywhere here. It's on the subway systems. It's, it's you know, it's all around you. So um, that's when the kind of uh, idea came to make it about one, one typeface. And design, graphic design, and <coughs> don't tend to get much attention from proper serious filmmakers. Did you, do you know why that is? And also, why did you think that it might be a good idea to you, for you to go where few filmmakers have gone before? Well, I, I think now it's much more, um, well, even then, I think it was much more a uh, popular, um, you know, subject for people to kind of think about. Sorry. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> um, I mean, in 2000, in the early 2000s, like people were, everybody had personal computers and people were using fonts more. It wasn't some like, uh, you know, arcane science of, of typography. Whereas like 15 years before that, if you said font to most people, nobody would know what you're talking about. And today, everybody knows what fonts are, has a favorite font, or knows that they kind of like these ones more than these ones. So um, I think at the time, it was starting to become more of a sort of general um, topic that people knew about and could, could talk about and had feelings about. And, um, and, and since then, I mean, there were no documentaries about, there were no, there was, there were no documentaries about graphic design, like theatrical length film, you know, films in theaters before Helvetica. Um, and now there's been, you know, dozens and there's series and all these kind of things. So I think it was just the start of really um, a deeper desire uh, in the public to know more about design, whether it's product design, automobile design, architecture, whatever. Um, and in the past 15 years, I think we've just seen that accelerate. So for those who haven't seen Helvetica, including me, I'm ashamed to say, can you tell us what, what happens in the film? Is, is, there, uh, is it just simply telling the story of, of the Helvetica font or is there a kind of like dramatic finale or how, how do you structure a film about a font which yeah. is so ubiquitous as to almost be invisible or, or boring? Well, Ariel gets killed in the end. I'll just tell you that right now. Um, <laughs> is that a baddie? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's partly a kind of chronological look at, you know, the, the past 50 years in kind of type trends. Um, but it's also kind of an introduction to a lot of um, type designers, graphic designers, design writers, um, who, uh, again, have been previously had not been kind of, I, I think, known by the general public outside the design field. So, um, I don't know, they're all just fascinating people. I mean, I had a total, um, you know, uh, ace in the hole. It's just like, I, I had all these incredible designers, people like Eric Speakerman or David Carson or Paula Scher or Michael Beirut or Vignelli or Sagmeister that, that you know, had, had um, been doing so much um, speaking and educating and they were fantastic at that. So really all I had to do is to set a camera up and say, just talk, talk to me about what you do. Talk to me about typography and how about Helvetica and just let them go for a couple hours. I mean, it was, it was almost as simple as that. But um, I think the idea of making a film about a single font um, itself is kind of the, it, the, the concept of that was um, self-propelling. Like once you kind of like, oh, I'm gonna do this, a full movie about Helvetica. Well, half the people are like, oh my God, that's amazing. I can't wait to watch that. And the other half of people are just like, what the hell are you talking about? How can you make a movie about one font? Um, but there's still a reaction and there's an interest. And um, so just really, I, all I did was kind of think of the idea and and put it out there and it just sort of, it just sort of went. There was a, um, pent up demand to watch a movie like that or be in a movie like that. Like I couldn't believe that 
in 50 years or however long these careers, people like Massimo Vignelli or Matthew Carter or, or whoever, um, no one had asked them to be in a documentary. I mean, it was it was shocking to me. So they were um, they were ready to, to to talk about this stuff, and um, and I'm always I just if people are talking about something that they love to do, it's I I, I want to watch that. You know, I I don't care what. I kind of don't care what it is. It's like if you can sense that passion, um, it's just, it's, it's. I think it's wonderful to watch. I, I like to watch people talk about things that they that they love and to, and to see it and also see how it affects me. Um, you know, we read type all day long on screen in adverts everywhere, signage, um, and we don't really think about the you know who did it, why they did it this way, is it working, is it not working. I mean, it's something that incredibly influences our daily lives, and I, I don't think m many people give it much thought. So, so you cut this film then, and 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 then what did you do next? You, did you book a theatre for a premiere, or did you get a distribution deal, or, or did everyone you speak to think you're crazy? This is the public aren't going to be interested in this. How do you how do you uh, when if it's the first film about ever made about fonts, that's a tough sell, right? Into the <laughs> <laughs> the theater industry, I imagine. I got it. It, it wasn't though. <laughs> Surprisingly, it, it it really wasn't. Um, I mean, I made the film just with like credit cards and friends and family, just kind of you know self financed it. Um, yeah, I never had to go into like a boardroom of investors and 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 try to sell them on um, you know making a film about about Helvetica. Um, and then when I kind of announced the film, maybe six months before it, it was released um, and just started, you know, blogging about it, doing kind of, you know, early social media, um, it just kind of took off uh, to the point where, you know, all the screenings that, that we set up were sold out. It had this um, a premiere at South by Southwest. And then um, it just kind of went from there. It went to 100 cities uh, in, in the first, you know, three or four months. So um, there was, again, there was just a demand for it. There was demand for it. And and um, if you have something that people really want to watch, you can, um, there's a lot of freedom you have in terms of how you're going to release the film. So um, yeah, and I had been producing and releasing documentaries before this. So I kind of knew the, you know, how to do it. So I turned down all the distribution offers Weinstein and Sony and all these kind of people had, had tried to come and, um, and distribute it, but I had already connected with the audience for the film, so there was really nothing that they could do that I couldn't do myself, and 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 you know better and probably keep more of the of the proceeds. So, so I self released it, um, and then it was actually the second documentary on Netflix when Netflix started the streaming um, service. Because up until 2007, it just had been all been discs. But then Netflix started um, streaming that year, and there was no, they had no subscribers to it. Uh, but then within like a year, it was, you know, just kind of took off. And Helvetica was on Netflix for 10 years. That was the first of what's now become known as the design trilogy of films that you made. So tell us, obviously, the success of that made you think, oh, I've got a, I've got a whole field to myself here. So what happened after that? Um, I, I became a filmmaker. I mean, I didn't, you know, I didn't consider myself a, a director before, before Helvetica, but, um, after it premiered, I was suddenly a filmmaker. And, and also I was, um, you know, there were other things I was interested in that I wanted to make films about. And, and I, and the beautiful thing about, about documentary filmmaking is I get to learn about these subjects that I, I'm really interested in and curious about. And, and want to spend two or three years uh, looking into. So right on the heels of Havetica, I was also, you know, into gadgets and product design and industrial design. And I was like, well, here's another thing. There's also not, hasn't been a documentary about, about this. Um, and at first, you know, Helvetica, it's kind of a Trojan horse. It's like, it's about one thing, you know, the title, it's one font, but then it opens up, you see this whole world of creativity and you know, people and work uh, behind it. So uh, with Objectified, I was kind of like, well, do I do that? Do I find one thing? Um, I remember I had conversations with um, Experimental Jet Set, the uh, Dutch designers that are graphic designers that are in Helvetica. 
and they were like, oh, you should do it about chairs, just about the chair, just like a whole film about the chair. And you can, you should call it sit on it. Um, but I, I, I felt like there was so much to talk about in product design, like consumerism and, you know, um, sustainability and, you know, so many things that, that uh, I, I wanted it to be more of a broader survey. So, so it, it didn't have a single focus like that. But, um, but I think it's always about the, the thinking involved. I think that that's for me, Objectified was about connecting all the dots between these very kind of disparate um, designers and, and areas and disciplines um, and products and kind of looking at the, the issues that are universal am among all of those. So um, yeah, so I just went right into to making Objectified and like two years later, Objectified came out and I did the same thing with the next film. You know, I've been traveling so much and looking at cities and seeing different cities and what was working and what didn't work. And, you know, I thought that was another another documentary that hadn't been made. I hadn't seen something that was really like interesting to watch about urban planning <laughs> um, and and architecture and just, uh, you know, again, how that affects our, our, our daily life. So, you know, I went right into that. So within the course of between 2005 to 2011, that six year span, I was pretty much nonstop either going to make the film or out around showing the film, you know, in a couple hundred cities. So um, it was a real uh, burst. And then I, I kind of like said, OK, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll step away and try some other things. Uh, and then, you know, it's been it was a few years later that I you know, started working on, on films again. And then most recently, the, the Dieter Rams film. So Helvetica was about a, a two dimensional thing. And then um, Objectified was about three dimensional sort of human scale objects and then um, what was the third one called? Urban, um, urbanized. Was called? urbanized was about the city. I suppose you'd run out of, <laughs> you couldn't scale up yeah. on that unless you talked about. I could have done like the universe, like universalized <laughs> or something. Yeah, there was a little bit of a like powers of 10 thing there with starting with the smaller one and then going back out to this and going back out. That wasn't intentional. That's just kind of the way it happens. I don't think, a, <laughs> I think a lot of my decisions about filmmaking are not intentional. <laughs> They're just, um, again, things that I, things that I want to explore, you know, and, 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 and I just kind of let that, um, curiosity just lead me to to you know what I'm going to make what I'm going to make next and it's it's about do, do I want to watch this film I mean I'm making films for me really and and luckily there are other people that also want to see the same same type of film but in the end it's like what do I want to spend three years of my life you know working on um and 10 years later talking about so um so that's really what what the drives me so that brings us on to Rams then, your film about Dieter Rams. How did you settle on making a film about Dieter Rams? There's probably lots of other designers that would also be deserving of yeah. this film. Yeah, oh my God, there are. Um, well, in 2008, when I went to first interview Rams for Objectified, uh, you know, I just spent one afternoon with him, but, um, but he said something that I thought was really interesting it didn't end up in the film, but it's actually in the um, the extra bonus footage uh, uh, for Objectified that is streaming on our, our site for you this week too. But he basically said like, if I had to do it again, um, I wouldn't want to be a designer. And I was just thinking this is one of the most influential designers alive. Um, and, but he regrets, you know, being a designer. Um, so that was something that st stayed with me um, and intrigued me. Um, so, you know, years later, I kind of just assumed that somebody would be making that film because um, after Objectified came out, Rams just had this huge resurgence. Um, you know, he had big exhi uh, exhibits, I think, at the Design Museum or the v and I mean, he, he, he just was, um, I just expected somebody to be making a film. And I talked to uh, Mark Adams from Vitsu, and uh, and Mark was like, "Nope, he doesn't. He doesn't want to make a film. He's he's you know he's feels like he's told all the stories, and he hates the media, and he just doesn't want to do it." Um, and then that started my um, my campaign of of like wearing him down um, because a film can do something different than 
a, a you know an interview, a printed interview, or a book. It, it, they both have their own strengths. But but I thought that um, you know Rams is very concerned about um, passing on the kind of the, the philosophies and the ideas both to designers and non-designers. Um, and it was really important to him. And if, I think he just felt like it was the, the right time. And since, you know, we'd worked together before and he knew I wasn't going to destroy his house when I, um, when I came, when I arrived to film, film with him, um, you know, he finally uh, agreed to do it. So for those who don't know who Dieter Rams is and his incredible influence on, on, on the world of design, um, just give us a quick overview of, of who he is and what he did that was so important. Sure. Well, Rams was the um, design director at Brown uh, from the German electronics company uh, from the uh, very early 1960s through to the, the 90s. So, um, you know, he came into Brown as a, a young um, architecture student and just uh, graduated from architecture school, wanted to be a landscape architect, Kind of got a little side job at Brown, um, helping redesign a um, uh, an office extension they were building, and then they I think they they recognized his talent and pulled him into product design and and it just kind of went from there. So um, you know he and his team at Brown were responsible for just you know so many kind of groundbreaking um, consumer electronics devices. Uh, he also, at the same time, started designing furniture and shelving systems and chairs, uh, which is um, were, were released through Vitsu, um, you know, which has kind of continued to uh, release his furniture designs. So, um, it, you know, I, I think a lot of the sort of uh, attention to Rams out, from outside the design world came um, when um, Apple, when Jonathan Ive really kind of um, acknowledged uh, some of the influence that, that Rams had had uh, had on the Apple designs, particularly the first iPod and, you know, a, a lot of the, um, the later uh, like iMacs and things like that. Uh, and, and then, um, you know, he's just uh, uh, just been this you know, super influential um, not reclusive, but just doesn't really he's not it's not about the spotlight for him. It's just about the work. Um, so I, I think he's, uh, I think he's just super interesting, uh, uh, person, but the, the, the what I thought, I don't, I think people don't, uh, maybe know as much or understand as much as, is, um, his kind of environmental, uh, philosophies and his ideas about sustainability, which he's been talking about since the 1970s. And that's kind of part of the reason that, like I mentioned earlier, he, he sort of regrets being a designer. I think he's really proud of all the work that he and his teams accomplished and and um, it's some amazing stuff, but he thinks that there's just too much unnecessary stuff in the world. Um, and for, for someone who started from a very kind of idealistic vision of, um, you know, post World War Two rebuilding Germany, democratic products, long lasting products. Um, to get to the point where we are now with, you know, very marketing driven, um, you know, disposable stuff. Um, I think he, he feels that he had some role in that somehow. Um, and, and that's kind of why he, he, he looks back and, and wishes he had been a landscape architect, basically. Um, as I mentioned before we started the, the live interview, I went to visit him in, I think it must have been 2000 and three even it was just after icon magazine started and um and and as you rightly said through the apple products people were starting to talk about this Dieter rams guy again particularly as when the iphone came out the calculator on the iphone the clock on the iphone was yeah. exactly the same as the products that um Dieter rams had designed yeah. for brown and before that people had noticed that the i uh, ipod or a remarkable similarity to a kind of radio, portable radio that he'd designed. Mm -hmm. And um, so we launched Icon magazine, and um, I think we'd done two issues or something like that. And Mark from Vitsu got in touch and said, would you like to go and meet Dieter Rams? He could maybe be one of your, your next cover interview. <laughs> I was like, super excited, of course. And, um, and Mark said, well, let me contact Mr. Rams. He doesn't like to do too many interviews, see what he says. 
So he, the next time Mark went to see Dieter, he raised this with him and he'd taken with him a copy of Icon magazine that had on the cover Anish Kapoor, the artist. And Anish Kapoor was standing there, bolt upright like this, with some artwork behind him or some, you know, paint splodged wall. And he was wearing sort of baggy jeans and a, and a, a brown jumper looking sort of very ordinary. And Dieter apparently was so taken with this cover and the idea that he might be on the cover that he actually cut out a picture of his own face and head and stuck it, <laughs> stuck it on, <laughs> on top of Anish Kapoor. <laughs> and then the next time I spoke to Mark, I said, Mark, is, um, do you think the interview with Dieter's on then? And he said, um, what do you think? And he showed me this picture. <laughs> so then we went down, went down with, with um, Mark and a photographer to the same house where, obviously, where he lives now near Munich. And I took an iPod with me and showed, showed it to him. And I think it was the first time that he'd seen the iPod in, in, in real life. Wow. So, and what did he, do you remember what he said about the iPod? Well, I, unfortunately, the interview had finished then. Um, so I, I, I didn't, I wasn't able to include that in the interview. And, and, and I think I said to him something like, you know, a lot of people have mentioned that Apple products owe something to you. And he sort of, you know, was very modest about it and said, well, maybe you could detect an influence or, or something like that. But he was, he was very interested in the, the idea of the iPod. He was fascinated by this, this product that had sort of taken, taken what he was doing all those years ago into a whole different technological sphere. Yeah. It's interesting, like how non-digital he is and it's not that he's a Luddite, but uh, he, he, so much of his career has been about simplicity and about simplifying our lives that um, adding the internet and, you know, a personal computer or smartphone or something, I, I think to him does not simplify his life. Um, so he has no, no patience for it or no interest in it. Because the, the radio that he designed that had the, the circular dial on it, I mean, that was the, probably the first sign that most of us got that there was a genius of design at Apple that had figured out that you had this box that contained a thousand songs as digital bits. But how would you, how would you find the song you were looking for? How would you, how, it's not like a record collection, you, you put your records on a shelf and you, you flick through them. How'd you do that on a, on a, with the digital files? And so Jonathan Ives' genius was to invent the circular scroll reel which paid homage to Dieter Rams's design. And I think that Dieter kind of had a twinkle in his eye when he realized that there yeah. was a, there was a new, a new King in the, in the room almost. Yeah. He, he, he takes it as a, as a compliment or as an extension of what they were doing. He, he doesn't feel like, Oh, he, Apple ripped him off or something like yeah. that. I think he actually, I think he and Johnny Ive are very, very similar um, personalities. Um, in the sense that they're they're about the work, they're about the materials, you know. That that's what that that's what um, you know get, gets them up in the morning. It's not about doing interviews or or being a personality or or, or anything. They just want to get in there into the shop and and work with other designers and 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 make stuff. Um, and uh, it's super focused and super driven uh, to 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 achieve that. Well, our viewers can watch all of Rams um, today, tomorrow, and Sunday, because you very kindly, as I said earlier, um, unlocked it on your, your website. Um, that came out two years ago. So I guess you, your next film must be well underway already. Is it another design film? Uh, I've got um, two films that I've started working on um, prior to the uh, pandemic um, shutting down a lot of the travel. Um, one is a design is a design documentary and but the, and the other is a, a music film but it's it's kind of much bigger than that and um, that's all I can say about them <laughs> thus far but um, yeah it's been it's been weird. obviously everybody's you know this is impacting everybody's workflow. Um, for me not to be able to go travel and, and film uh, or go show films um, has, has been a, an issue. Uh, but, you know, conversely, everybody's watching so much more stuff online now that, that you know, um, 
what independent filmmakers and filmmakers in general do is suddenly kind of in, in a way more more part of people's daily lives so um so yeah I, i'm 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 you know waiting to kind of continue working on 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 both those projects um you know again like everybody else just sort of in a holding pattern a little bit here until um things normalize so you're not going to tell us what the design film's about then nope. not even a hint is it about a person it's not about a person so it's another it's another wide ranging you know thematic one okay circus in in all of the interviews you've done with all the designers through all the films you've made which which person was the most impressive or the most surprising or the most amazing um i suppose apart from Dieter rams because you went back and made an entire film about him who else really impressed you with their genius or their wit or their um uh, incredibleness um I, I, it's like, there's been a hundred designers and architects and thinkers in the, in the film. So it's, it's, um, I can't single out one, um, one person. I mean, uh, also it's all just feels so personal to me. It's like, I, 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 I think about the interview that I did with, with, uh, with, you know, Massimo Vignelli, but I also think about Massimo making espresso for everybody in the crew before we started and, you know, serving it to us in, in cups that he and Layla had designed and just, you know, being in this world that, that he created. Um, and, you know, it's just, again, I, 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 I have a really great job. I get to travel and, and, and talk to these people and they'll actually talk to me, you know, if you, it's actually a, a, a great piece of advice. If you really want to meet someone or, uh, you know, get involved in, in what they're doing, just make a documentary film about them or about what they do. And you'll actually be able to go and, you know, and see them. Um, but I've gotten to meet just God, my, some of my heroes in, in design and people like Oscar Niemeyer or, you know, Norman Foster or, you know, Rem Koolhaas or just, just, just so many, um, and, and, and just soak up what they're doing. Um, so, so I, I can't single out one, you know, it, they're, they're all amazing. Um, and it's, it's just been such a, uh, uh, you know, I've been so lucky to be able to kind of do this and, and, and also to get to share it, you know, it's in, in some ways, these are personal explorations for me. Um, and the the byproduct is this this film thing. Um, it, it's almost just like a means to an end. It's like I get to go and talk to all these people and learn about urban urban design or you know what whatever. And, and the artifact ends up being this this film. But in some ways, that's almost secondary for me. Like I get to first learn about all these things and then. You know, oh yeah, I got to put a film together for it. <laughs> but um, but again, I think that so it's so I'm just I'm fascinated with what all these designers do, and um, and I think that film is a just a good medium to to show it and to explain it and for 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 people to to be able to watch and try to connect. Um, you know how these designers work um, connects with with their own lives or what they're role is in this whole whole thing was there any designer that you haven't met that you'd like to meet um there, i mean yeah like I, every film i make a lot like a really long list of 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 um who could potentially be in it, it it's hard because um you know I, i'm an independent filmmaker you know i'm working on very independent budgets like sometimes i just can't go to Beijing to talk to, you know, someone or, or this all, like, like with the Rams film, I think it's a good example. Like I, at first I wanted it to just be Dieter in his voice. Like he would be the only person interviewed in, in the film. And, and I, I kind of tried to apply this sort of um, like the 10 principles, Dieter's 10 principles to filmmaking, like as a little, filmmaking as possible, just make it as simple as I could. And I only if I absolutely had to bring in other people did I did I bring in other voices just to give it give it more context. But um, uh, there's a there's a there's a inclination to kind of um, put as many people as famous designers as you can in, in the film just to get kind of um, eyeballs. 
And, uh, and I've tried to kind of resist that. So I, I start out with a long list and I really try to be very methodical about who I really, who really needs to be in the film. Um, but the, for every person, every designer who's been in, in one of my films, there's uh, dozens and dozens of others that whose work warrants a full film. Like everybody I've designed, uh, everyone I've interviewed, um, every designer I've interviewed, you could do a full length feature film about easily. Um, it's just about, uh, you know, how much can I do? Um, you know, I'm just, I'm just one, one, one filmmaker. So there are many, many, many filmmakers, many, many designers I'd love to meet and, and interview. Like I can't, I can't, I can't give you a, a, a list, unfortunately. What is it about filmmakers when they're making um, a film about an individual, they always call the film either after just their first name or just their second name. So you've got Rams, Marley, Lincoln, but the one about Zinna Zinda Dan, there's loads of them. It's always bugged me. Why can't the film be called Dieter Rams? This is the, you could talk, say the same thing about books, about nonfiction, you know, biographies and stuff too, or and it was, it was just called Jaws. It wasn't called, you know, that shark movie that didn't scare you or something. But the shark didn't have a first name and a second name, did it? Unless I'm missing <laughs> something. <laughs> I, I I don't know I I'm uh, I mean I started out with Helvetica and and you know I I, I just I, it's not that I'm stuck on one word titles but I, um again just simplicity just kind of keep bear, bear it down to its essentials I don't know I I wanted to make a, a film I think maybe my next film is going to be like a ten word title with like a subtitle and, and everything but I try to resist it it's interesting when the BBC uh, broadcast Rams they they were like rams like nobody knows what it is can we add can we change the title and i'm like oh well you know i, I was resisting it because they were like well it's bbc4 no one's going to know what this is if we you know don't you know so we ended up having to it was had this we had to say um it was called rams colon principles of good design like they wanted at least design or something in there to to um tell people what it was about but but i don't really I don't really care. I just, you know, I, I like a, I like very simple, bold, one word. There it is, to the point. And it could be confused for a film about male sheep. Yeah, well, there was an Icelandic uh, fiction film, narrative film, very well regarded, called Rams. <laughs> that was about this relate this these brothers uh, who um, have sheep. <laughs> Well, how many people I wonder went to the wrong <laughs> movie theater? Only one, only one that I know of. People <laughs> ran across town in Los Angeles to see the screening, got in, and then realized very quickly that it was, was not. This weird Icelandic it, wasn't about, it wasn't about livestock, it was about Dieter. Okay, we've got, um, we've got some questions from our viewers. Um, okay, oh, do you hear now? Uh, Ty asks, thanks Gary, I learned a lot about the power of typography in my own editing projects through your documentary Helvetica. Do you think Rams's design principles could be somehow applied to film projects? And he's talking about Rams the designer there, not the sheep. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, like I mentioned before, this idea of simplicity and trying to kind of, um, uh, I don't want to say transparent filmmaking, but not Sometimes it's um, you can see when a filmmaker is kind of showing off, or, or when the the hand of the filmmaker is very apparent. Um, and other times that you just forget that you're watching a film, like you're so kind of involved in 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 the person who's on screen or their story that you just forget about the filmmaking. And, and I kind of like I strive for that, um, even though sometimes um, it, it 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 doesn't happen. But uh, but I, I like I'm always thinking about that. Like, how can I make the simplest film possible? Um, it, and specifically with Rams, I mean, I could not make a really busy, cluttered, you know, um, film about Dieter Rams. It would just be, you know, antithetical. So, um, so I thought about it a lot with 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 this film, um, and I, I don't think I necessarily achieved it. But but I, I always try to make the simplest film possible. Um, but uh, yeah, this you know it, you can you can into the the ten principles you know good design is 
innovative, you know, you can insert filmmaking instead of design or pretty much anything. And, and you know, most of the principles will, will, um, will I think work. Um, but there is, a uh, you know, no, no film, no documentary is truly objective. You know, it, it's every choice, uh, you know, every frame and where to cut and where to have the music and, you know, where you go from there is a decision by the filmmaker. So there's no such thing as like objective, you know, truth and documentary. Um, but I still try to, I think, be as as honest as possible with the with the filmmaking. Um, I don't know if that that really makes sense. But um, but yeah, I think I think a lot of his, his principles apply. And do you feel a pre any kind of pressure when making a film about design for the film itself to be designed? Maybe according to the principles of the thing you're talking about, like if you're making a film about how Vesica, are you thinking maybe consciously or subconsciously that it needs to have a sort of clean modernism to it? Or you well, just it's interesting. Your normal style? I mean, with Helvetica specifically, um, it, it, making a film is a lot like graphic design, um, especially when you're talking about a sensor of typeface. Like these are rectangles. And what we're doing, cinematography, is really just arranging forms within a rectangle. And if you have a, you know, a, lower a word in lowercase bold Helvetica, it wants, it forces you to sort of frame it in a specific way. You can't just be sloppy with it. It's very linear and, you know, kind of demands a certain approach. And um, so I think the the, I mean, I, 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 I sort of hired my cinematographer, Luke Geisbuehler, based on the fact that his parents were both Swiss graphic designers. And I like, I knew he would have an eye to sort of frame this typeface in a way, and it it was totally totally justified, but um, yeah, I think a lot of times the subject matter dictates the approach for sure. Which leads us on to the next question, Abdo, who's actually I think asked a question on every interview we've done so far, um, says, "How do you use cine how do you use cinematography to show your ideas, especially with lights?" And camera angle. So you kind of already answered that, but maybe you could talk about the craft of, of filmmaking. Yeah. Uh, um, it, again, as little as possible. Like, um, I generally don't use lighting. Uh, it's almost all, like all of Rams was natural light, um, except if we were in a, inside in a building. But even, you know, everything we shot in his home, uh, it was all just available light. Um, and you know, that's one thing. I mean, it's not specifically the cinematography, but with a documentary, it's a very um, kind of awkward situation. Like there's a camera there and there's a sound person or, you know, um, people who are on camera are very aware that they're on camera. And and my job as a, as a director in those situations is to try to make them forget that they're on camera so they'll actually like speak freely um, and be comfortable and go places that they don't normally go in, you know, an interview. Um, so I, I try to be really uh, minimal about, again, the equipment that we bring in and I let people ramble. I'll let them ramble and go down other paths as long as they want to. I don't care because it, it, it's not about, um, it's not about that. It's about getting someone into the mindset where they say that, that thing that, is you know going to be in the in the film, um, and ninety nine percent of what we shoot doesn't make it into the movie, so it, it is kind of a hard thing to um, accept that most of what we do and um, you know is never going to be seen. But you kind of have to do that ninety nine percent to get the one percent of stuff that's just golden. So um, so yeah, a lot of my of my process is, is is that getting people into a mindset where they can just really kind of talk and think and they're enjoying themselves and they're having having fun being being you know having this conversation you know um so again that's not a specifically a cinematography thing but it's it's an approach i think to to interviewing and then once you've then you shot all these hours and hours of um interviews and and so forth then how do you then start to assemble that into some kind of structure and some kind of narrative do you transcribe everything do you pin things on the wall do you edit or how do you do that 
Yeah, I mean, a, a little of everything, I guess. I mean, documentaries are made in the in the editing room, especially films like like mine. Um, I don't go in with some very structured, you know, uh, uh, script that I'm going to follow and I'm just going to go out and film things to kind of fit in. Um, uh, the, the editing process is also an exploration. You're, you're looking at all these interviews and all this filming and you're trying to kind of see the bigger arc. And there's always kind of an organic arc through all these stories and people and work and places. Um, so it's really about just kind of soaking in it, just spending months and months and months watching and thinking and, you know, it's, it's like a puzzle. You're, you're arranging things. And does this make sense? Does this work? Oh, what this person says, so someone's going to say that again later. Maybe we can, you know, link those two. Um, and you find those little handoffs, like in objectified, I didn't ask Dieter about Apple. I mean, I just asked him about what companies he likes now. I can't remember what I asked him, but he did this whole thing. And he was like, Apple is the only company that, you know, I forget what he said, taking design seriously. And then boom, there's the handoff to Johnny Ive. I mean, you, you can, you see all this stuff once you've got it in the editing room. Um, but we also do a lot of simultaneous editing and filming. So, you know, we'll be editing and two or three months before the film's going to be released and we'll go, oh, this is, you know, that's when you see the holes. You see like, oh, we need this here. So let's go out and film that and bring that in and you kind of work with the editor. I've had, uh, um, I've been lucky to have fantastic editors um, on all the projects and, um, you know, they have to really kind of soak in it too for a year. Um, and that's when you see it's kind of a leap of faith because you don't really know what the film is going to be like until the last couple months. Um, but you just have to kind of believe that it's going to arrive at a certain interesting, <laughs> you know, resolution <laughs> at the end. And so far it's worked out that way. And do you ever, do you see the films as being finished or do you sit there in the premiere ever and think, Oh God, I just remembered that amazing quote that would have been perfect for that bit. Yeah. Definitely. Um, like Rams, especially now that it's so easy to make changes and you're sc screening the films digitally. Rams, I probably made from the night it premiered to when it came out like on iTunes or, or Apple or whatever, um, you know, fixed video. I probably made 200 changes to it, at least. Some of them were really minor. Um, and some of them were there's a lot of subtitles in the film and subtitles are hard. That, that's, that's one thing this film, uh, that was a challenge with this film that I hadn't really experienced a lot in the previous films. Um, this one, you know, there's 75% probably subtitles. So that's a thing you're trying to read and look up and follow the story and, and it can get really confusing. So even taking a word out of the subtitle, if that allows you to kind of that split second to, to understand it and then watch the rest of the scene, um, it makes a difference. So I probably made, you know, a hundred changes like that. And then just little other, other tweaks too. Yeah. You, 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 after you watch it a few times and you see people's reaction to it, to certain things, um, you know, you're like, oh, maybe we'll extend that scene another second or two, let people, you know, settle in or, or, or whatever. So yeah, I, I, I would still be, you know, I'd still be out there shooting trucks going by with Helvetica on them and yeah, yeah, given my druthers. So what font did you use for the subtitles in Rams? For the subtitles? The subtitles I think are in Helvetica. I think, I think they are. We used um, Favorite, which is a, a, a f face by uh, Dynamo in a lot, of, uh, um, a lot of the other graphics in the film, the 10 principles scene and stuff like that. But I think I'm pretty sure that the the subtitles are in Helvetica. It's kind of um, I'm I'm I'm. Lazy. I love that you're not sure. I love that you're not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I'm sure. Pretty sure all the films have had subtitles in. Where there have been subtitles, they've been in Helvetica. So. Okay. Final question uh, from Gareth. Hi, Gary. Big fan of your work. Do you think the current pandemic will have a lasting impact on design? Sure. I mean, I think it'll have a lasting impact on a lot of fields. Uh, and in a weird way, it kind of relates somehow to, 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 to Dieter and to the Rams movie, because it's, it's about um, reassessing how we've been living and working um, and consuming. And, you know, in, in some ways, 
it's uh, kind of forcing us to kind of reset a little bit in terms of how we work and um, and what we want to do with our lives. I, I think it puts certain things in focus. It definitely kind of shows the sort of disparity um, in this world, uh, economic, uh, um, you know, uh, like I, I think that it's, it's exposing things in our societies that are, have always been there, but now I think are, are just more amplified. Um, so I think a lot of a lot is going to come out. I don't know what it's going to be. Um, you know, for me as a filmmaker, I think it's um, it's interesting because like I, I want to try to document society's response to it or my own kind of feelings toward it. Um, but uh, yeah, how it's going to affect design, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like it's definitely going to make a lot of designers out there reassess what what they do for a living um, and try to kind of, I think maybe um, make a change to that um, and try to shift towards something something different. Maybe it's something that is more, you know, um, societal driven or or just maybe just, I mean, a lot of people are, are, are already just out of work or don't have work. So um, I think it can be a time to really think about what you what really in, you enjoy and what you want to do for the for the rest of your life, um, and putting a lot of priorities into focus. So I, I think yes, it's going to have an impact on design, but in a lot of other fields too. Yeah, and filmmaking, for example, because you were saying earlier on that the the number of people streaming your films has shot up in in the recent weeks. Um, which is great, but also you're unable to go out and make your film. I mean, is the world going to run out of films if all the filmmakers are locked down and not able to, <laughs> to shoot? Or are we going to see a new genre of home shot, you know, domestic? I don't know, Mar Marcus, we could just make this into a movie. We'll put some B-roll in between the, the comments and there you go. But you'll, you'll definitely see a lot more Zoom footage in, in, in documentaries <laughs> going forward. I'm not sure it's a good, uh, it's a good thing, but... Do you know Liam Young, the, the filmmaker, yeah. architect from LA? Uh, he, mm -hmm. he sent us a bit. We've got an interview, live interview with him in, uh, next week, I think. But he sent us, we invited architects and designers all around the world to send us video messages for the, a movie we made to launch Virtual Design Festival. And he delivered this amazing monologue from his um, self-filmed monologue in his studio in LA. And he was like, you know, um, the, the land of science fiction has become a science fiction dystopia. You know, there, there are queues outside the gun shops. There are people selling fake masks on the street corners. And pre he predicted that there'd be a new um, genre of um, like lockdown apocalypse fiction coming up as filmmakers, first of all, struggled to figure out what was going on. And second of all, couldn't leave their homes. So would, had to, had to like, deal with what was at hand. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's, and, and <clears throat> as much as I would like, you know, to think that in a couple of months, things will be completely normal, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be so, you know, like, like, like any other um, kind of external force on your life, you, you've got to adapt and you got to figure out how to, how to work within it. Um, and I don't know any artist or musician or designer or architect that has like suddenly stopped being creative. I mean, we're all still, you know, creating things. We're all still trying to kind of make sense of, of this situation. And um, yeah, I like, I, I still have faith in design and in research and in science to kind of, you know, come up with some solutions, whether it's just kind of adaptive solutions or if it's actual like, you know, scientific, uh, you know, biological solutions to this this pandemic but um it's certainly going to have a have a, a shadow on on our interpersonal behavior for sure for for a long time well on that note let's wrap it up it's a wrap thanks so much for your time gary thank um, you and thanks for uh, allowing our readers to watch rams on your website and good luck with your next project thanks so much Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.